Hello, I'm Glenn Fay, Research Fellow here at the Centre for Independent Studies. No question's more fundamental to the study of economics than what drives the wealth of nations. Why do some countries prosper while others languish? Decades of research shows that a population's knowledge and skills is key to its future fortunes, not just in developing countries, but also in richer ones too. The message, smarter countries ultimately become richer countries. And Australia has clearly benefited from a great education system. Indeed, until recently, Australia boasted 28 consecutive years of economic growth until the pandemic put an end to it. Yet one headwind could be a handbrake on our future prosperity. And that's our flailing education system. Australian student achievement in international assessments has been in steady decline for many years. And that's despite spending more on schooling than similar countries and consistently increasing funding. To discuss the cost of underperformance in the sector and how we can turn around the decline, I'm pleased to welcome today's guest. Dr. Eric Hanyashek is Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's author of The Knowledge Capital of Nations and is widely recognised as the world's leading authority in the economic analysis of education. Rick, a warm welcome to the CIS and thanks for joining us. It's wonderful to be down in Australia again. <laughs> Well, welcome down under. <laughs> Look, um, I'd like to get some definitions out of the way. Knowledge capital, what does it mean and why is it different from the way we've traditionally thought about uh, the, the, the differential levels of education between countries? Well, knowledge capital is a, a term that my co-author Ludger Woosman and I coined to indicate the skills of the population. And it turns out that these skills are pretty well measured by international achievement tests like the PISA test. Um, for, for those of you who are unaware of the PISA test, what they have done from the OECD is to develop, for example, in math, a set of problems that they just march around the world and mm -hmm. assess who can solve a variety of math problems. It turns out that that's a pretty good measure of the skills that the future population will have. And it's a good measure. It's a good measure of what determines future economic growth. Now, tr that's not always been the case though, right? Uh, traditionally, a lot of other more crude measures have been used to talk about relative education, the, the number of completions of, of secondary school, the number of years of school, post-school education, uh, even you know, the, 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 uh, the retention rates, all these sorts of things. Why, is it, why have those measures proven to be not as indicative of uh, knowledge capital than something like a PISA test? Well, Glenn, you're, you're right that economists have been trying to figure out why some nations grow faster than others for roughly 30 years of comparing <laughs> the growth of different economies. And it was just a matter of pragmatic uh, analysis that we had measures of how many years of schooling nations had, and we didn't have very good measures of the quality of that. But if you think about it for just a minute, you can see that the um, a year of schooling in Japan is not the same as a year of schooling in Peru. Mm -hmm. And when we just measure school attainment, we're assuming that in one year, people get the same amount of knowledge. But that's not the case, obviously. Um, and economists, in fact, were revolting against trying to even compare nations when they only had years of schooling to measure the uh, achievement the human capital of nations. Once we had measures of the quality of learning, like the PISA test, we could suddenly explain almost all of the differences across countries in long run growth. So look, let's, let's talk a bit to that. So help convince me that, that the knowledge capital model is a good predictor. How do we know? You've mentioned that it's, it's, it's got quite, quite a good explanatory power from a statistical perspective, but how do we know what we're capturing here is differences in knowledge capital and not something else when we observe these long run trends? Well, that's, of course, the challenge that has faced researchers is to convince people like you <laughs> that it really is a causal relationship. In other words, if we raised 
PISA scores, we would see in the future larger growth rates across countries or in a, in a country that managed to increase its uh, scores. Mm. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to convince ourselves that this is a causal relationship. There's always skepticism about parts of it, but it turns out that um, in simplest terms, if we, if we look at countries that increased their international test scores over the last 30 years, and compare that to what has happened to their annual growth rates, we see that there's a close relationship between those. And there are a variety of other comparisons that we can make that allow us to be pretty confident that this is a causal relationship. It's not something caused by faster growth and it's not something that has to do with other attributes of the economy, but in fact, it's the skills of the population that count. And it makes sense, right? That um, in the long run, what's gonna count is the skills of the population, not a bunch of other things that come and go. Perhaps this is a, 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 a oversimplistic question then, but is there, is there not a causation issue here too? Um, is it that richer countries happen to have better education systems? Or is it, or that uh, you know, the smarter countries become richer countries? Uh, are we are we looking at it the wrong way around? No, I, I think it's all the latter that smarter countries become richer. Um, one of the things that happens uh, when countries get richer, they buy more of everything, and one of the things they buy more of is more schooling. But once we take into account what people know, like these math tests that we march around the world, um, the years of schooling have no effect or no relationship with growth rates. And so, um, well, the other way around, which is something I guess we'll talk about in a little bit, um, just putting more money into schools doesn't ensure that people can solve more math problems. It doesn't mm -hmm. ensure that they have more knowledge um, what we've seen internationally is that um, countries that do well are not necessarily the ones that spend the most on their schools, but in fact, the ones that have figured out how to get good teachers in the classrooms and make sure that the teachers are doing the right thing. Before we move on to issues around education policy, I want to still can remain on this knowledge capital model and, and discuss its source, you know, how, how accurately it describes um, the trajectory. And I think one of the interesting parts to me, uh, you know, as an education economist is the ability to explain the development story of the 20th century. That is the relative decline of Latin America or the growth puzzle of Latin America and the relative rise of East Asia is it, is it, would I be right to say that the knowledge capital model is perhaps the best explainer we have for that? Well, I think it does, it fits very well. Um, if, we, if we went back 50 years or 60 years and looked at regions of the world and where they were, you would see that um, the US was the richest, uh, in the richest area of the world, Europe second richest. And I'm when I say US, I'm actually in, including all of the old British colonies, uh, <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the US were doing very well. Uh, next were the European uh, countries. And then following that was Latin America, which was actually um, behind Europe and the US and, and the colonies. Um, but it was way ahead of East Asia in, uh, say, 1960. Um, you might think if, uh, if I were an educational economist in 1960, trying to project out the, the future, that Latin America was the region that was going to grow the fastest in the future because it had relatively high levels of schooling in terms of years of schooling, uh, particularly compared to East Asia, um, and it was behind the, the more developed regions. But we all know the answer by now is that East Asia started uh, at 50% of, of the 
income per capita in Latin America in 1960, and now it has four times the income uh, per capita. Um, and it's, it has to do simply with the fact that um, East Asian schools are better and that, and that they're teaching their kids more math, more science, more language than uh, Latin America. And Latin America has just languished uh, without the ability to produce growth in part because the population is not very skillful. What, what do we make of the current trend? So East Asian countries, and I'm thinking particularly Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, provinces of China, continue to lead the international league tables by some margin. Uh, and you know, countries like Australia have, have declined uh, by an equally large margin. Now, what does that imply for future prosperity of the region, including Australia and our neighbours? Um, so countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, you know, the, there's a mixed record there between some of our closer neighbours and some of the more successful East Asian partners. What does that mean for us? I think we always talk about East Asia as one block, or at least in the US we do. Maybe you're a little bit closer to the East Asian countries, but there really <laughs> is a lot of variation within East Asia, as you point out. And what we're gonna see is the ones with better populations, more skillful populations are going to continue to grow. And if, hopefully it's not true, but if Australia were to continue to decline, I think you would see for uh, future pressure on growth rates in Australia. Um, and that uh, the relative balance, economic balance, across the regions and across the countries is going to be affected dramatically by differences in growth rates. You know, most people who aren't economists don't realize it, but small differences in growth rates have <clears throat> enormous impacts on future economic well-being. And so the um, double digit growth rates of China, for example, over the last 25 years have produced a, a nation that is quite developing quite rapidly. It's still way behind Australia and the US in terms of per capita GDP, but it's growing a lot faster. And you can do the arithmetic to see when it crosses over in the future if the current situation holds. I'm going to take a question from Fred here, and I'm going to twist it a little bit with something I wanted to ask you too. And it's about the the, I guess, the predictive success of the knowledge capital model. Now, you've mentioned that, that, of course, this is based on tests like PISA. Now, these are cognitive skill tests, but a lot of discussion these days is about a wider range of skills that are related to cognitive skills, but not quite the same. Is there a risk that focusing away from those cognitive skills could change the, the knowledge capital within countries? Or is there, do you think that there's a, uh, an intimate relationship between those areas? Well, the, um, there's been a lot of recent research on social emotional skills and grit and persistence mm. and, and other psychological elements to suggest that these are important. And I, I think we all know that from our own workplaces that there are cognitive skills and then there are other traits that in fact affect how well people fit in and how well they work on the job. We know pretty clearly, I think, from a now extensive information that cognitive skills are really important. We think there might be some other skills that add up to also being important, but the research is not quite there yet to be all that confident that the, those are skills that are gonna have huge payoffs. Um, and it's the research is not clear on how malleable these other skills are and whether we can change them. So that my own view is that concentrating today on cognitive skills makes sense. Continuing to do the research on the broader set of skills that we think might be important also makes sense. But that uh, doesn't imply that 
we should be changing our policies today because we just don't have sufficient information to do that. Perhaps Knowledge Capital uh, version two will be a, uh, a critical thinking module or something like that. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, to uh, take a question from Chris while we're still talking about our region and the question of, I suppose, that the other growth uh, puzzle of the last 20, 30 years is that of Japan. Um, you know, a country that has had a, a very high level of education for the very, over the very long term. Is it, is it, do we think this is an education thing? Is it an issue maybe that Japan's education system reached its peak and, and there's little way to go? Is it, I guess what I'm getting at, is there a marginal returns? Is it, does it top out at some point when it comes to knowledge capital? Well, it's very hard to tell whether this folds over at some point and stops, but um, as best we can tell, um, we would expect Japan to continue to grow in the future. And now it is possible to do a variety of things to your economy to, to help slow down growth. And in the short run, um, the kinds of things that we talk about all the time of high degrees of, of regulations and, and limits on the uh, capital and labor markets and so forth mm -hmm. can in fact lower short run growth rates. But over the long run, I think that the high levels of skills, cognitive skills of the Japanese population will in fact lead to uh, continued growth. I mean, it's still an extraordinarily rich and productive mm -hmm. nation. Um, they've had a few hiccups, uh, but I think that they can in fact uh, recover in the future and we will see them as one of the uh, high-flying nations of the world. Well, while we're still on knowledge capital, the, the discussion that you raise is one of a relationship between the education system performance and one of economic growth rates. Is it also translate to other economic variables that we're interested in? Issues of general living standards, obviously uh, productivity, uh, wage growth, there's obviously micro studies that talk to a lot of this stuff, but does it also play out in, in your more macro analysis too? Well, in the macro analysis, what we're really talking about is productivity improvements that lead to this long run growth. And <clears throat> the idea is that skilled populations, in fact, lead to improvements in productivity, either mm -hmm. inventing new things or, in fact, finding better ways to produce the things who, that we've been doing in the past. And we see all kinds of examples of that. We just have to look or look around at the light bulbs that are in the in our ceilings that have suddenly changed in the last 25 years um, and have produced much more efficient kinds of production there. Um, so I, I um, now what happens when we go to further questions about things like the distribution of income and individual wage rates, that interacts heavily with um, the, the economic institutions of each country, the tax system, the transfer system, and how uh, productivity is rewarded by to individuals. But in general, you expect people that are more skilled to earn more, and we see that in every country of the world, that the more skilled populations earn more. So um, that that holds at all levels for the individual and it holds for the nation. Do we think there's possibly diminishing returns, I guess, it, in a knowledge rich world? Uh, you know, much of the conversation is, you know, I suppose around that skills question is that some of those old <laughs> hard skills are, are less valuable. Uh, does, could it be that you know, with the advent of you know changes in uh, structural changes to economies and the skills distribution, does that threaten the, the the predictive power of the knowledge capital? So I don't think so. I mean, I think that what we've seen is in fact reinforcing the idea that skills are important. Um, we've gone from agricultural economies to manufacturing economies and now to knowledge-based economies. And if you think of a knowledge-based economy, what's it gonna ride on? Well, it's knowledge. 
that's, that's what's going to be important. And I think that the future will be more of the same. Now, we there's all kinds of questions always about things like, will robots take over and artificial intelligence uh, um, replacing humans? And in fact, that's part of productivity improvements, but I don't think we're going to do away with the people. Uh, in fact, past history suggests that some of these inventions, instead of eliminating jobs, they manufacture new jobs. Yes. Now, the, the, the danger, of course, is that it's not the same people that are the uh, ones who are the most productive in the future, so that some aging people, perhaps like myself, uh, find that uh, the, the new people are taking over jobs for us older people, um, and we have to worry about that from a societal standpoint is that how do we make sure that uh, people remain productive throughout their careers and have the, in, the improvements in their own jobs and skills so that they're active members of society? Now, so you've mentioned economic growth rates being explained somewhat by knowledge capital, but what if we are interested in those distributional issues? Is it a matter of improve, is, uh, increases in knowledge capital largely those of lifting the average, lifting the bottom, lifting the top? Does it make much difference in terms of how effectively knowledge capital increases or, or is important to, I guess, the wealth of nations? So we've, we've made some attempts to, to look at that. It's a little bit hard in the overall national growth rates to, to pick it out precisely. But to us, it looks like um, if you compare, is it rocket scientists or is it having a, a high level of base knowledge in the economy? Um, it looks like both are important. It, knowledge, uh, rocket scientists invent new things and figure out ways to improve the productivity. Um, but they, um, rocket scientists are able to get more out of an economy if they have a strong base, a high level of skill, highly skilled base. That's what we see. And in fact, it's complementary uh, that um, we see that those rocket scientists are better at inventing economically productive things if they can work with a highly skilled population. To COVID-19, now schools were closed around much of the world, in fact, almost the entire world, and often at very different uh, periods and different nature of what that closure looked like. Some, some systems seem to adapt more and be more responsive. Some seem to you know, manage hybrid models different states, different schools, different school sectors, very different results around the world and between regions. What's the, put it all together for us. What are, what are some of the implications of the COVID-19 learning loss, school closures experience? Does that impact on knowledge capital too? Well, um, that's, that's one of the big issues of today, of course. Um, and it's, at least in the United States, it's been quite frustrating to me because the one thing we know is that the current cohort of students that's in primary and secondary schooling today was damaged. They were harmed mm -hmm. by COVID, by the closures of schools and the rather jerky uh, restart of schools that included a variety of hybrid learning situations, and so forth, uh, at least in the United States, most of the discussion has been about what I would call the logistics of reopening schools. How do we make them safe? How far do desks have to be apart? What kind of protective kinds of situations do we have? How much uh, um, online learning is there compared to in-class learning? Extraordinarily little discussion has gone into what do we do to help out this current generation that has been hurt. Um, the current generation has individually been harmed. Um, about a year, 
almost precisely a year ago from now, um, Ludger Woosman and I did some estimates for the OECD of the impacts of school closures uh, last year from basically March of 2020 through uh, much of school years. Um, and at that time we said that uh, the typical student, the average student in primary and secondary schooling would lose about 3% of their lifetime earnings because of the, of the closures. We've subsequently, as we've seen that the schools did not go back to normal schooling in September of 2020, but in fact continued to have various closures and various um, hybrid situations. My current estimates are that, that this generation might have lost six to nine percent of their lifetime earnings if nothing is done about it. Um, this is going to have huge implications also for nations, because what this says is that as we look in the future, we're bringing on a less skilled group of students into the workforce. The skill of the population will be less than it would have been without the pandemic. Um, and economic growth will be slower because of this. And this has a huge impact on individual economies, the uh, loss of future skills of the population. Um, to me, the only answer is to try to make the schools better because that's the only way that we're gonna make up for this. Now, I should say that some people say, well, kids are resilient. They'll, they'll just pop back. And, and yes, they missed all the schooling, but they're ready to return and they'll just be back on the old track. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have lots of evidence that that's not the case. Um, if I can tell my, my favorite story of this um, uh, that relates to my co-author, uh, who's a German. Um, in, the, in the 1960s, the Germans... Um, had a very mixed school system where some of their states in Germany started their school years in January instead of September, which was normal for most of Europe. And they decided, well, we'll get in line with the rest of Europe. And they did this by having short school years for a number of students in these states until they could turn around the school system and get everybody started in September. If you look into the uh, Social Security Register of Germany and look at the earnings of people, you can pick out this cohort because their earnings are less than those immediately before them and immediately after them because they had this shorter school year, less learning, and they did not just pop back in a resilient fashion. But in fact, this short school year followed them throughout their careers. That, that, I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting case. And I mean, I hope that we don't witness some of that. And perhaps Australia is a very interesting case when it comes to the school closures experience, because we actually had very different responses across our states and territories. In one state, the state of Victoria, schools were closed for now, it would be close to 40 weeks. Uh, whereas in some of our other states and territories, they were closed for less than one week. Uh, so it's clear that there's some implications around that. And, and it's now that schools have returned, closed again, then they'd uh, returned back to school and then closed again. It seems that there's also an element of this that's, that's harming students from disruption, not just the time spent not in the classroom. And one of those, the, the burning issues today is, is that of the mental health shadow pandemic. That, that's being discussed and particularly the that students here in New South Wales, for instance, where we are, that there's a statewide lockdown at preventing all students from being in school, even though students in our regional areas have got no exposure to the pandemic whatsoever. And if anything, it's those students that need that face-to-face -face learning because they already start behind their city peers. Is it not just, is it the regional variations within countries 
and between school sectors, for instance. You know, there's obviously examples in the US between states that have returned, districts that have returned, private schools that have returned, some charter schools that have returned. Are we witnessing live a, a, a social experiment in, uh, in the way that different, um, uh, different school systems are responding? I, I think we are. I think this is going to occupy uh, research economists for some time in the future trying to, to pick out the total impacts. But I'm pretty confident in my prediction now that the states of either Australia or the United States that did not go back to schooling uh, quickly are going to have students that are less well prepared and they're uh, going to stand out to employers. Employers are going to recognize who has the preparation and who doesn't. And we're going to see very different uh, responses. So it's not just everybody who's finished secondary school and has a certificate is going to be treated equally because they're going to be very different uh, situations. Um, now, it's, it's I picking up on what you said, there's just no doubt um, in any of the evidence we have that disadvantaged kids are being hurt a lot more than more advantaged kids. The more advantaged kids have um, you at home helping your kids um, and making sure that they're working at their schooling and the more disadvantaged kids don't have that. Um, they might have parents that have been out in working, uh, providing, running the stores and doing whatever mm -hmm. in the economy, and they're not learning as much. And what we're going to see, in addition to um, a poorer workforce in the future, is a large, larger variation in uh, the preparations and skills of people that's going to show up in income differences in the future too. Let me tell you one policy response from, from our government here in New South Wales, and that's been particularly the interest in the, the school leaving cohort, what we have as year 12, and the exit exams, which we call the HSC, which are really formative for university entry and, and, and tend to be quite, well, quite good predictors of future success as well. The policy response has been, it doesn't really matter because we can just lower tertiary entry standards so that this year's cohort can enter university without impediment. Is that short-sighted? Absolutely. I mean, what you're going to see is that um, every, the same number of people, maybe even more, go on to tertiary education, uh, but they don't learn as much chemistry in that first year as they would have if they were better prepared with their math and, and secondary school chemistry. And what we're going to see is that the products of this system are uh, not going to be the same as the ones who came through just before them that had that better preparation. Um, and so, yes, we can make up for that. We can make sure that uh, graduation rates are higher. Um, at the end of secondary school. We can do that with a stroke of a pen, but that's not going to provide them with the skills because just having that piece of paper is not the same as being able to solve those chemistry problems. Rogers uh, made a comment in, our, in the discussion here as well, and, and it's an important point that, um, that Australia actually does have a standardized test that we run every year. When results were taken in 2019, 2020 was skipped, 2021 results became available just a few weeks ago. And despite the predictions, much like your predictions, that the state of Victoria, which had significant school closures, actually had no statistically significant decline in achievement compared to 2019 performance, nor did it have a statistically significant difference to other states in terms of progress. Does this, does this suggest that our education system has bucked the international trend and, and found some miracle solution? Or do you think maybe there's more to the story? My first guess would be it's in the data, not, not in the learning of the, in the schools. Um, but that, that's something um, that I should point out that's the same in the US and it, 
and I think it's the same in Australia, is that we lost a lot of information on where kids are mm -hmm. and what's been learned in schools because we didn't do testing immediately uh, in 2020. We're getting back to it now, but uh, what we've seen in the US is that we have moderate losses um, compared to prior years in performance of the tested students. But what we've seen is that a lot of students are not tested because they aren't back in school. They're at home and the testing system doesn't pick them up. And so we, um, uh, people go around saying, well, all the, all the tests indicate that it's not as bad as we expected, but just the people that weren't tested are the ones we worry the most about too. And so um, I, I don't know what they've done mm -hmm. down in Victoria, um, uh, but, um, and I don't know what they've done in New South Wales either. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that the information we're getting from the current testing is not quite as good as it was in the past for one reason or another. Oh, well, I will add that there was a, an increase in the non-participation rate of, of, of the assessments. So uh, our guests could be right about that. Time will tell as we delve into that data more over time. We're going to move on to policy shortly. But just before we do, I'd like to take Elena's question, which is more about uh, teaching practice. So you've mentioned that, of course, teaching quality largely explains uh, is, is that explanatory factor, is, is the X factor when it comes to explaining performance. Is there, a, is there an issue there that, well, not every classroom's the same too. Different teachers emphasize different teaching practices. How do we make sense of all that? Is it also classroom quality, not just uh, school quality, teacher quality per se? Well, let me start uh, with not quite your question, but saying one of the things that we've learned out of the pandemic where we've had lots of of um, hybrid instruction and lots of online instruction um, is that the teacher is really important. That mm -hmm. having somebody in working with the student is an extraordinarily important uh, factor in learning and that we're not prepared to do away with teachers and just go to online instruction. Now, one of the things that we knew uh, before we uh, had a pandemic was that there is huge variation in the effectiveness of individual teachers. Some teachers are just better at teaching than others, independent of who's in the classroom. Now, the kinds of evidence we have actually is looking at uh, largely the learning gains in different classrooms. So that uh, if we look at somebody in grade five, um, we, we look at their performance at the end of grade five compared to where they started grade five. Um, and some teachers get lots larger gains over the starting point than others. And so that takes care of largely the classroom composition kinds of issues because if you allow for what they knew at the beginning of the year, then we can uh, take, take the gains that have been had. We knew before um, the pandemic that there were huge variations. Every place we've looked, in every country, in every situation, we see that there are big differences among teachers. And that, that's not particularly surprising. It's in almost any occupation you look at, there are big differences in how well uh, people perform their activities. Um, one of the things that I think has happened is that the, these differences have become a bit magnified in the current pandemic situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people are, good at having uh, online instruction, others aren't. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are good at trying to figure out where the students started the year and trying to mold the instruction to what people know at the beginning of their in-person instruction as opposed to others. 
this is the hope, um, by the way, if you know, if you if you want to get into policy, the, the policy is pretty simple. Do what we knew we should do before the pandemic, but do it, do it more seriously. What we've seen, uh, what we saw before the pandemic, and um, I think the schools in uh, New South Wales know it, is that it was hard to make the adjustments to use the more effective teachers better, to use mm -hmm. them more intensively, um, because we had very rigid work rules uh, that applied to the schools. And we, uh, even if when we knew who was the better teacher, we could not use her more, uh, more effectively because we had the same organization of schools. Coming out of the pandemic, uh, the only hope that I see for, in fact, helping this cohort of students that has been damaged by the pandemic is to make sure that they have more effective teachers, to make sure that the most effective teachers are really working to bring these kids back. Well, it's also a, a key objective of our current government is, is exactly that. There's a, a review into the quality of teachers, uh, or there's seemingly always a review into that issue, but uh, but it's one that's certainly on the radar. And there's a recognition, I think, in Australia that that we do have a, a, an issue in, in the quality of our teachers, and particularly uh, early uh, early career educators that, that perhaps have lacked some of the training that, that you would hope for. Now, unlike the US though, Australia's teachers are remunerated quite well, but like the US, it's a very flat pay structure. Now, surely that doesn't work. If different teachers perform differently, as you've explained, how can it be that all teachers are paid the same in the modern era? Well, it can be because that's the institution that we see in actually in, in a large majority of countries of the world is that um, people argue, well, you can't really distinguish between these two people that are doing the same job. How can you pay one more than the other? Um, well, it turns out that, you know, in the, at least in the United States, the 80% of the workforce that is not in unionized occupations um, get paid very differently. They get paid mm -hmm. much more closely to their uh, productivity and what they're adding to their job than uh, than those in the, in teaching, but in schools where we have very rigid pay schedules that don't allow us to pay attention to how effective teachers are, we get the results. We get the following falling PISA scores in Australia that I think are closely related to the fact that we don't run Australian schools in ways that are aimed at imp improving or maximizing the learning of students. Well, I, I mentioned that we have few, we've had these multiple reviews into the quality of teaching and we did come up with a, with a program. Here's what it includes. The years of teaching, the accreditation, uh, meeting accreditation standards, uh, observations, you know, many, sometimes by peers, sometimes by, sometimes external. Are we on the wrong track when we're talking about performance? Is there, are there more objective ways that we could measure performance uh, that, are, that can actually reward high-performing teachers better and, and better identify teachers that need more help? So the first two things that you mentioned, the credentials and the experience levels of teachers have been shown over and over again to be basically uncorrelated with effectiveness in the classroom. Having a more experienced teacher does not guarantee that you've got a more effective teacher, um, nor does having uh, the full credentials that you get from your schools of education in Australia guarantee um, highly effective teachers. The third thing, if you have evaluations by peers or supervisors um, could potentially be on the right track. Um, what, we, what the research has done is to try to systematically look at 
student performance and doing statistical modeling of differences of teachers and have pinpointed uh, more and less effective teachers. It turns out that I think uh, who is the more effective teacher by these sophisticated statistical models is exactly the same as who is effectively a teacher by the parent walking into the classroom <laughs> and observing what's going on. It's That's clear right. that at least at the extremes, the very effective teachers and the very ineffective teachers are well identified by the principal or headmaster of the school. They're well identified by the other teachers in the school. They're well identified by the parents in the school. They're probably well identified by the janitors in the school. That there's no, no mystery about who are the really top teachers and who are the really ineffective teachers. It's just that we refuse to use that information when in fact we make decisions, management decisions about how to organize and run our schools. We don't pay the highly effective teachers more. We don't pay the highly ineffective teachers less. We just argue that, well, we've got to pay the everybody more because otherwise we'll lose people from the classroom mm. without recognizing that that's really doing damage to the students that, that don't get the effective teachers and without realizing that that is really going to make it very difficult for us to save this generation of students that have has been hit by the pandemic. Rick, are you saying we need to fire poor teachers? You know, when we use the word fire, everybody <laughs> immediately stiffens up. Um, I think that what we need to do is find better occupations for our poor, ineffective teachers, um, and that we have to ensure that our very effective teachers stay in the classroom. And that means that we pay attention to effectiveness in the classroom when we make management decisions. And are there systems that we can look to that are implementing something that's, that looks like what you're talking to here? An effective appraisal system that rewards quality teachers, that, that uh, you know, has an intervention approach for underperforming teachers. Is there anywhere we can look to for hope? Well, the, there aren't a lot of places because it is rather standard to run schools on the basis of degrees and experience levels for, for salaries and, and uh, early tenure for all teachers so that there's very little uh, fall, fallout from doing badly. Um, in the US, we have a, a couple of very large systems that have done something very different. One of them is Washington DC, our nation's capital, um, which has not had a particularly effective school system historically. They've been near the bottom in part because uh, people who send their children to schools in Washington DC are generally poor and disadvantaged uh, families. Um, about Eight years ago, Washington DC dramatically changed what they were doing. They introduced a very um, systematic evaluation system of teachers and they decided to use that evaluation system to determine the rewards for the top teachers and also to dismiss bottom teachers. So Washington DC, ended up paying on the order of 25 to 30% uh, increases in the base salaries of the top teachers. And, and by that keeping the top teachers in the system. And they managed to uh, dismiss or convince an, uh, the most ineffective teachers by these evaluation systems to go someplace else. Um, and what we've seen in aggregate performance of the school system is that Washington DC has had their students perform better, improve better 
over time than any other large city in the US. Dallas, Texas um, has introduced an even more sophisticated evaluation and hiring system. It's not as clearly evaluated, uh, but parts of it have shown that if you reward the top teachers for teaching in the most disadvantaged schools, you can improve the performance of the students there. So that the worst schools in Dallas, Texas, um, once they were given teachers that were highly performed, had shown that they were very effective and were rewarded for it, the worst schools came up close to the average school in Dallas, Texas within two or three years. And so it is possible to make these changes. In both situations, um, they involve huge political fights to in fact institute these systems that were aimed at improving student outcomes as opposed to making sure that the personnel in the system were treated well. Well, it doesn't this touch on you know, one of those critical issues of education policy here and, and elsewhere that, that the discussion is often focused on issues about inputs, not necessarily issues about outcomes. And the, there seems to be to be a need that we need to shift that conversation from a policy perspective. Now, I hear people, you know, perhaps responding to, to your comments a moment ago around increasing remuneration and and I pull a, a call to, I suppose, your earlier comments that from decades and decades of, ex, of evidence show that resources alone don't make much difference, if any, to education outcomes. What makes it different, what you've just described in, in Dallas and DC, compared to what's typically done with resources? Uh, I mean, I, I think the answer is not that money doesn't matter or can't matter. What it is, is a statement that how you use resources and money makes a difference. And mm -hmm. using money well, in, in the cases of Washington DC and Dallas, rewarding effective teachers turns out to be very good policy. Um, I personally think when I look around the US that the most effective teachers are woefully under, underpaid. We, we can afford by the impact they have to pay the most effective teachers a lot more. But then again, the ineffective teachers are woefully overpaid. Mm. Um, and so if we insist on not paying attention to how we use funds, we don't get much out of it. Now, there's also a long run element to this too. So if we change the, I suppose, the incentives around what performance looks like in the classroom, yeah, it might change the performance and behavior of current teachers, but it seems to me that the more that you introduce a more flexible or you know, performance-based approach, you might also you know, encourage a new type of worker to the teacher workforce as well. Do, is there any evidence that might suggest that you know, what either of those, maybe it's the effort premium or the selection premium, that, that either of those or both of those necessarily explain why uh, a more performance-oriented model might work better? Sure, I mean, it, it, what there is is evidence from multiple nations around the world that um, you know, the teaching uh, occupation has changed over time. Um, in the mass, in the, in the large number of countries where women are the majority of teachers, um, it used to be professional women could be either teachers or nurses. Mm -hmm. And today in most countries of the world, we're seeing that women can be doctors and lawyers and business people. And the alternative occupations have siphoned off a lot of people who previously would have been teachers and that would have been pretty skilled at it. Um, what we need to do is not stop women from being doctors and lawyers and uh, uh, business people, but what we have to do is attract people that are really good at teaching, that would like to teach 
and pay them a competitive wage so that they see that staying in teaching is a good thing for them. We're very quickly running out of time, but I'm just going to take a few questions before we before we wrap up. One one from Ed comes back to this issue about the economic returns from education and the long run differences in performance between girls and boys, uh, particularly in, in different domains than others. Given that there's that long run effect in terms of labor force returns and, all, and differences in preferences, all that sort of stuff, do we also think that that will play a role in terms of the gender difference will also impact upon knowledge capital in, in interesting ways? Well, I think that, you know, at, at a micro level, I think we're going to see that women's salaries start to come closer to men's salaries. In the United States, uh, you see it in entertainment. Um, the college uh, entrants in the U.S. are now very heavily weighted toward females as opposed to, to males. And we're going to start seeing that the distribution of income by gender is going to be changing in the future. Um, you know, we we historically have not taken advantage of the skills of many of the women in our populations, and we're starting to do that more, and it's going to pay off. Just as we're, as we are wrapping up, just I'll, I'll note a comment from Elena that surely a lot of this is just basic economics, uh, a lot of what you're talking about, but you know, seemingly doesn't really become education policy. And, and if I can kind of get us to a last question, I want to draw you on here that you've noted the long run nature of education reform and its impacts on economic returns. Our, our Australian education minister has a goal to turn around Australian performance in PISA for over the next 10 years and in a quite an ambitious goal to reverse the, the downward trajectory. Is 10 years a realistic time frame to turn around a system and to start to see, and how long after those 10 years of turning around the education system might we see results in our economy? So I don't think that 10 years is too short in some sense to start getting the kinds of returns if we seriously went after improving the policy. Now, we wouldn't see the results within 10 years because improving what happens to kids in, in school, what they learn in school, uh, has no impact on the economy if they aren't in the labor force. So you have to wait till these higher quality students get out into the labor force. But the estimates that I've done in the past that suggest um, improvement in achievement of students on PISA tests or something like that, uh, the estimates I've done have been over a 15 year period and you don't see much of, of an effect for 25 years from now because it, you have to an improvement period in the school and then you have to wait till they get into the labor force. But when you add it all up, it is a tremendous impact on the future economy of nations, Australia or the US, to in fact improve the schools, to lift the overall performance or importantly to um, lower the number of people that just basically don't have the foundational skills that are needed in a modern international economy. And doing the latter has the advantage that it also solves some of the income distribution problems that most of our nations struggle with. And our final one for you is we're just, just about out of time. And thanks for everybody who's submitted questions or you weren't able to get to everything. Uh, if we're, what can Australia's government and others like it, what can we do to lift our knowledge capital? Um, manage a teaching force that is based upon the learning of the students, that is based upon having effective teachers in all the classrooms. Now, um, I haven't studied the full distribution in Australia. I've been there several times and, and have some ideas that it's not all that different from the US system. And in the US system, it's really not a huge part of the teaching force 
that is completely ineffective, but there are some ineffective teachers there that we tolerate now that we shouldn't be tolerating by um, just marginal changes in the way we manage our school system can have huge implications for the learning of students because you uh, eliminate the fact that your son or your daughter had one bad year. Well, one bad year is a huge portion of their total learning experience, and it can make a huge difference to the economy and to their future well-being. Well, there we go. Some, some notes for our policymakers and our educators for where to go from here. Rick, thanks so much for your time, and thanks for everyone that joined us today. Thanks for having me. For decades, the CIS has been a fiercely independent voice, working hard to deliver evidence-based public policy, especially in the critical area of education. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you to help us advance our cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.